you and welcome to Genre Chat. I'm Caleb Walton and today I'm really excited to welcome Tosca Lee to the show. How are you doing this evening? Great. Thank you for having me, Caleb. I'm really excited to have you on here. I know you've had a lot of stuff going on. You just had the book release. So you've been doing the tours and interviews and stuff with that. What else, um, what other projects do you have going on right now? Well, I've just finished the final edit for the sequel to my new release. Um, so my new release is The Line Between and the sequel is called A Single Light. And uh, so the sequel is coming out September 17th. And so I've just wrapped up the very last look through. And so it is ready to print. And uh, it's always good. <laughs> that must be like a, a, a very crazy, stressful thing to be releasing yeah. the first book and then working on the second and trying to get that done. But you know, it's always like that. You're always, you know, once you kind of start rolling and you get those deadlines going, mm -hmm writing one and editing another or you know there's that's always awesome. some kind of overlap happening that's so. awesome does the whole process of like the the rewrites and the proofreads and the editing and the proposals and all that does it get easier over time or is it just something you have to <laughs> no <laughs> you know it probably does to some extent because you know what to expect and also, if you've worked with the same editor before and the same team before, you know, that helps as well. So I guess, you know, you, you know what the routine is after mm -hmm. you've done it a few times. So in that way, it's easier. But as far as, you know, if you're going to be a picker, you're, you're always going to be a picker. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you want to rewrite, you know, till they pry it out of your cold, dead hand, which is <laughs> how I am, they have to pretty much, you know, break my fingers to take it away. Mm -hmm. You're always going to be that way. So, um, and it, there's always kind of that, uh, did I do everything I could? For this so now there is I have and and I'm, I'm a bit of a perfectionist so I completely identify <laughs> but I've heard different different opinions from different authors where they're like some of them say well yeah I like to flip through my book and read through some of the pages that I remember writing and some I think it was Lynette Eason I interviewed her and she was like nope I don't want to touch it after it after it goes on the shelf I don't want to see it <laughs> no I I'm with Lynette because by then you've written rewritten rewritten edited, 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 copy edited, proofread. You know, the last thing you want to do is look at that book again, so. <laughs> you can probably recite it from memory at that point. Probably, yeah, well, probably. I want to talk uh, today about thriller novels. I know that's what you've been doing a lot of. That's what the new, the new book that just came out is. And I just love how suspenseful and, and just edge of your seat all of the books of yours that I've read are, it just, you know, oh, just keeps you turning through the whole thing. Why did you choose to write thriller novels? What is it about that genre, a genre that appeals to you? Well, I like reading them. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, sometimes we feel like we should write certain kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that a common mistake that we can make at the beginning is to feel like we should write certain kinds of things when what we really like to read is something else. You know, so um, I'm a big advocate of write what you like, and I enjoy thrillers, and I like um, psychological suspense, and, you know, I've done several biblical fiction historical novels, and, you know, it's like, you don't want to eat cheeseburgers every single day, you don't want to eat sushi every single day, sometimes you want to shake it up a little bit, you know, and you want something else, so I, I don't want to write the same thing every day either, so... It was time to, to do some thrillers, and I really like keeping readers reading late into the night, way past bedtime. I just, I think it's fun to see, well, you know. You've done that to me plenty of times. I think I went like to 2 or 3 a.m., I think, with the progeny, and I was like, okay, you have to put it down and go. <laughs> So, Every time yeah. you keep someone up too late, it's like a little merit star badge of honor in my imaginary <laughs> Thing. It makes me just feel really good. So, I love it. Yes. I love, I love that it. feeling myself. I love when I'm reading and it's like, oh man, it is late and I'm going to regret this, but I just need to read like one more chapter. Exactly. I think the best, like the nice little sweet spot when you're reading a really good book is when you almost forget that you're reading it <laughs> when it gets yes. to that point. I'll, and I'll, you start nodding off because it's so late. And yeah, there's, yeah, there is that. The book, yeah. <laughs> to the binge reading. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Put now, would you classify the Progeny series as a thriller? I know that, that, that kind of can fit into a lot of different categories. Yeah, I mean, that's a little bit of a, 
a genre bending um, duology, which is not something publishers usually like when you're like totally mixing and bending genres, but um, the overarching uh, genre would definitely be a thriller. Yeah. Awesome. What are some ways that you incorporate suspense and tension into your novels to just keep people turning the pages? I know uh, one thing that, that struck me when I was reading The Progeny is a lot of questions were answered very shortly after the beginning, like maybe 40 or 50 pages in, but there were still plenty of things to keep the pages turning even after some of the initial mystery was, was at least partially solved. Yeah, so I think there always needs to be some kind of story question. Mm -hmm. and it, you know, it doesn't have to be your classic thriller type question of who did it or, you know, whatever. It, it can be a question of, you know, will the girl get the guy or will they get the job or, you know, whatever the goal is. I, I think there's the overarching question, but then it's really important to put those little hooks in along the way and, mm -hmm. and pull the reader along. I also think that it's really nice, regardless of genre, um, you know, at the end of a chapter, yes, that chapter has its own arc of its own mini arc, but um, I like leaving it a little bit on a cliffhanger so that mm -hmm. the reader is compelled to start the next, the next chapter because they want to know more because there's something like dun dun dun, you know, like a little bit unanswered, right? So. So that's, that's how I do it. But, you know, there's uh, Donald Moss in his book, Writing the Breakout Novel. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got lots of great techniques for adding tension. Um, tension on every page is pretty much his, his mantra. And he even will have people just randomly flip through their manuscript. And wherever you land, how can you add tension on that page? Like, mm -hmm. amp it up just a little bit. So Raise the stakes. You can always find a way, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I forgot who said it, but it's, they said the key is always have, just ask yourself three different times, how can you make this worse? <laughs> and, and just keep making it worse. <laughs> and that's Donald Moss thing too. It's like, how can you make this matter more? Okay, mm -hmm. how can you make it matter even more? And how can you make it matter even more than that? And it's hard. I mean, it's, but that's part of your, you know, brainstorming and outlining process mm -hmm. when you begin, um, you know, thinking, okay, how, how could this matter more? Well, I also wanted to ask on that note, what does your writing process look like? I mean, do you do a lot of, a lot of outlining ahead of time? Are you more of like a, a seat of the pants writer? Or is it just like a weird little mix of both? Well, I'm a little bit of a hybrid, but I do, I have to have an outline and I've learned that the hard way. Mm -hmm. I would love to, I would love to be a pantser you know, Stephen James is a friend of mine and he's, he's a pantser, you know, and that's the fun part of it for him. The fun part for me is, is not getting lost. So, and I, I will just get lost and write myself into a corner without an outline. So um, I think people who can pants it are amazing and I'm so jealous, um, but I can't. So that said, I don't have like a, a super detailed outline. It's kind of a list of events more or less in order with some details shoved in. And then as I think up more stuff, I add it in. Um, and it's loose enough that when I'm in the process, I can leave a little room for mystery and, and allow mm -hmm. things to kind of happen on their own because things will always happen in the process. You know, it's, there's a big difference between 30,000 feet looking down and boots on the ground when you're like running through the maze. Mm -hmm. Your advantage is completely different. So. Exactly. I know a lot of times even characters will do things that you really did not expect them to do. And when I first heard other writers say that, I was like, how can your character surprise you? And then I literally had a character, I think I invented her to be the person that got killed in the next scene. And now she's the main character. And I don't know how that happened. <laughs> it's just, well, they, yeah, they do their own thing. I, I used to be just like that. And, um, you know, you're writing these characters, how can they write their own lives? Well, but, but strange stuff happens in the process and things kind of, you know, your brain is working at a different level when you're actually mm -hmm. living it, so. Absolutely. Well, on that note, we're, I know I've talked a lot in different classes and stuff I've attended on conferences about character development and all of just the deep layers that go into that how do you come up with your characters and then how do you really get deep into their, their motivation and what makes them tick? 
Well, I always have to think about what are the stakes for this character. And I always think about what is the outside goal, like the outward goal, you know, whether it's to save the world or get the cure or, you know, whatever the outside goal is. But I'm always thinking too about the inner journey. And so that's something you hear, you know, writers talk about a lot. And the inner journey is basically who, who does the character think they are versus who are they really? So mm -hmm. who do they think they are at the beginning and who are they really and how do they become that at the end? So there's that kind of inner arc and then there's the outer arc. And so I like to spend a lot of time thinking about that as I'm planning out my outline. You know, who, who do they think they are here? Who do they think they are here? And how are they learning more about who they really are through the process? I'm thinking about that. Um, and I'm just thinking about how multifaceted and multidimensional people are in general. And um, one of the things, again, I, you know, Donald Moss has so many good exercises, but one of the things that he does is he always says, what is the thing that your character would never say or never do? At the beginning of the book, what would they never say or never do? And now somewhere in the book, you have to find a place where they say and do those things because you're showing how through this series of events, things have turned topsy-turvy. And then you see, because we are all very multidimensional that way. And then you, you get these multifaceted characters. That's really good. Have you done a lot of research into like psychology and just, just things like that? I know you had mentioned before that you had done a lot of role playing games. Um, <laughs> that kind of helped. I, I remember you saying that kind of helped you get in someone's mindset, which is really yeah. what it's all about when it comes to writing. I, I used to say, and I, I still do sometimes, you know, everything I learned about characterization, I learned from role playing because the, the people that I used to play role playing games with, we would write out stories and mm -hmm. you know, kind of outtakes with our characters. We would write them. And so you're really firmly planted inside that skin. Um, so that was, that's a big one. Uh, what was the question again? <laughs> <What was your response? laughs> just, just getting, getting in their mindset, getting in the character. I know oh, yeah. the, the, the skin tight suit to see how they would react in every yeah. situation. Well, and also um, you asked about the psychology thing. I used to work for the Gallup organization, which has studied really? a lot about talent and, you know, things like that. And I used to teach workshops and give talks on, you know, the science in research behind different kinds of talents and, and the way that we harness our behaviors and mm -hmm. stuff. So I'm sure that some of that kind of feeds into it as well. Mm -hmm. But I also like to include the things that people struggle with. You know, there's a lot of people struggling with things like anxiety or depression or, um, you know, bipolar disorder or whatever it is. Everybody's got something. And I like, I like adding, you know, characters that, that people can identify with um, in that way as well, because we all have different things going on with us, you know, mentally and emotionally. So, yeah. That's really good. What about your, your the, just the general story ideas? I know a lot of the plots of your books are sort of the, the out of the box, off the wall themes. And, and I'd love to know how, I know it always starts with the what if question and it just goes, goes from there. I'd, I'd love to know how those, those ideas sort of get in your head and, and do you have like a, a collection of things? I know I, uh, who was that? Bill Myers, I spoke with him recently, he literally has huge just binders full of just like maybe one or two word ideas that he goes off of when he's trying to start a new project. I have um, folders on my computer um, where I will have sometimes longer documents with notes and sometimes it is just one or two words. Um, but I know what those one or two words mean because mm -hmm. I, the ideas that you come back to a lot that you kind of circle back to are the ones that probably you should really look into. But, um, you know, it was an editor friend who told me to write the story of Judas Iscariot. And I said, no, mm -hmm. I didn't want to do that. Um, and then, you know, I came back to that idea over and over and it got stuck in my head. And um, so that's how that one happened. The progeny was a fan who said, have you ever thought about writing a story about Elizabeth Bathory? And so I actually had to go look that up and see who she was. And then I, I actually had heard of her before. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting, but I don't want to do a historical right now. And so it turned into this kind of contemporary thriller about her descendants. 
So, you know, they, they come from different. The line between my new release um, was inspired by uh, headlines about diseases coming out of the uh, melting permafrost. So uh, that was completely a headline thing. Interesting. I love how random sometimes the thing. <laughs> Sometimes it's driving, you know, like when you're driving or you're doing something like folding laundry or taking a shower, like just like, mm -hmm. because your mind is wandering in those times. And then writers take those random thoughts and go, ooh, that would make a good story. <laughs> I was driving when the idea for, for my first novel, Demon, a memoir came along. And I was just, you know, here in Nebraska, the roads are flat and very straight. So, you know, your mind can definitely wander <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in in South Carolina, if your mind wanders, you may wind up in a tree. <laughs> There's a lot of wind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, the occur the new novel is set. Is it set in Nebraska, or it's set somewhere in the out Midwest, isn't it? It is. It's set in the Midwest. It starts in Iowa, and then it traverses all the way across Nebraska, which is where I live, and That's goes into Colorado, and then the sequel. Uh, I'd say about 85% of it is set in Nebraska. So this is, this is a kind of a homecoming for me. It's something um, I have never set a book in the Midwest. So it's, you know, kind of fun in that way. So, well, I, speaking of the, the setting of the book, I know, and, and I don't even mean really setting in a broad term because I know that uh, your books have, they, there's so many different settings that they go into, but how do you, you research that and then really immerse the reader into that environment? Because mm -hmm. Even something as simple as I think in one of the scenes of the progeny, just just a, a hotel room. Everyone knows what that is. But there were just little little marks. I think about like a phone book that had little crayon scribbles in it. Just, oh, yeah. just little details that so most people would never even think to incorporate, but it just immediately puts you in the room and you can picture the whole thing just just from one one or two little obscure details. Well, for the progeny, every single place that's mentioned, I traveled to write that book. Really? So, yeah, Zagreb and Croatia and Austria and really? Trieste, Italy, all those, uh, um, Slovak Slovakia and Bratislava, um, all those places. And also, I used to travel when I was with the Gallup organization. So I traveled mm -hmm. like for a living. So I've seen a lot of those hotel guide books with uh, kids' crayons. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I just think of, you know, that because you can see where people have scribbled or kids have drawn on it. And mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I guess that, you know, there's images and things that kind of, you draw from what you've got and then you MacGyver it together with duct tape and a paper clip or something, so. <laughs> and in that moment, it, it, especially in a scene, it, it really puts you in the mindset, okay, so the character noticed that, what does that say about them? What does that say about just, just the different things about the setting, just little tiny details that most people overlook can really make all the difference for getting you in the moment. Yeah, and you know, when you're, when you're painting like a, a scene or you're trying to describe a setting, you really don't have to describe everything, just a few little dots, mm -hmm. like those little connect the dot books that we all did when we were mm -hmm. little. Do you know what I mean? Kind of the connect the dots and it makes a picture. So you just need a few dots mm -hmm. and your reader will connect that and fill it out because they're really co-creating the story with you as they read it. So, yeah. I've heard, uh, I think it was Stephen James said something similar about character descriptions, about describing someone's a character's physique, what they look like. He said, you don't have to describe every element. You just have to tell them how the character feels. It was, yeah. it was, it was something very, very, and I remember thinking that does, and then he gave a couple of examples of, of doing that. I was like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Because, you, you know, just enough, like, just their overall, I guess, aura would be a, a way instead of like every, every physical detail. And then right. you just create the picture yourself because nothing drives me more crazy than getting like five chapters into a book and like, wait a minute, they have red hair? No, they don't. And then you're not, yeah. <laughs> then they're not going to have red hair because you're not going to let I, them. You really don't have to describe very much because I find that um, readers really like to kind of create those character images. And I've even asked before, like with some of my novels when I've taught, uh, what did Clay look like in Demon? And people will tell me. You know, well, you know, he's a white guy and he's got brown hair and he's kind of tall. I never once described Clay at all. I described a pair of pants he was wearing once and that was it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you really, you can get away with, with less than, you know, 
you really can't. I mean, I have very, very specific descriptions in my head of every, you know, about all the all characters that I read about, and I always wonder if it actually matches up to what the author was imagining. What they're thinking. Exactly. Well, um, the uh, character's voice. I know that's something, especially in first person, because I know several of your novels are written in first person. So not only do you have to sort of flesh out your voice as a writer, but also what the character what they sound like when they talk, what their thoughts sound like in their head. How do you go about just, just getting so familiar with just how every thought would sound and how they would express themselves? You know, I think that's probably where the role playing stuff kind of came in and, and writing so much for these different characters that um, I used to role play. But, you know, I, I, I think a lot about those movies that begin with voiceovers. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, so many movies you can hear the character's voice there's a voiceover at the intro so twilight for instance you know bella's saying i never have given much thought into how i would die you know that's like the, mm -hmm. the beginning of the movie is you hear her voice um out of africa the famous mm -hmm. based on the famous novel by isaac dennison um who was a woman actually um you know she says she begins with i had a farm in africa and it's got a cadence like that mm -hmm. so i always think of it like in terms of a movie voiceover like that and I you know what is and I'm, I'm listening for the sound of that and and it comes to you when you're when you feel like you've studied that character and you have a good idea you know think of it in terms of like a movie voiceover I like that and then it's sort of like your mind can sort of fill in the blanks yeah it's more about kind of listening than it is about trying to make it up like you know? I, I was struggling with what what tends to write what what sort of first person third person to to write my, the book i'm writing now and i was struggling so hard to what this character sounds like what they read and i started i rewrote it in first person and it was like oh that's how he sounds it just sort of just that last little click to yeah. sort of make it fall into place and yeah i, I love yeah. how they speak to you they really do speak to you it sounds a little little mentally unstable when you say it out loud and they really do speak to you when you're with other writers, <laughs> it sounds it's impressive. Normal. It's just the best. Yeah, and I, I really, I like first person a lot for that mm -hmm. reason. I like reading first person for that reason. Mm -hmm. it, it, it sort of takes, not necessarily some effort away, but it's it's sort of like, I, I don't, it's sort of strange. It just, it plays so much clearer in your mind while you're reading it. Yeah. Um, what are some challenges that you face throughout your writing journey, throughout, you know, your writing process, maybe something that you, you, you find frequently causes you, you know, a, a little bit of a stumbling block that, and, and how have you overcome that? Um, well, I, I have obsessive compulsive disorder. Oh. And, okay. So yeah, there you go. And, you know, and it's a little different for everybody. Um, I, I've put a lot of time into thinking why I procrastinate so much because even when a deadline is looming, I'm procrastinating. And I think it's because I really, I like editing and I like fixing things and tidying them up and making them neat and giving them shape and form. But first drafts are really hard for me to get geared up for because they're messy. I know that my schedule is going to get messy. My life is going to get messy. My desk my office, everything is, you know, I'm going to start dropping balls as I start, you know, getting more and more into this manuscript. And I don't, that's not how I prefer to operate. It's so it's uncomfortable for me. So, but first drafts are messy and you have to allow yourself to just kind of let it go during that time, because that is not the time to pick or try to perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but that is why I, I really like the editing process and, um, and first drafts that can sometimes be a real struggle. So, and when you have any sort of perfectionist tendencies, first drafts are awful. <laughs> <laughs> I actually remember I, I, I had a, one of the full 15 minute appointments they do at the Blue Ridge conference. And I was speaking with you about a, a something that with the project I was working on. And you said, how long have you worked on this manuscript? about six months he said okay is this all you've written I said, um, yes and I was a little embarrassed to admit it and he said how many times have you rewritten this 
<laughs> and it was like five or six. <laughs> so that's my, I rewrite to death. That's my thing. Yes. And so what I tell people, you know, I have just a couple rules for writing. The first one is write like no one will ever read this because it gives you permission to just be bold and not worry about what people will think because your first draft mm -hmm. is not the time. But the second rule is just get the clay on the wheel. So in other words, don't keep perfecting the part you've already done. The temptation is so very strong, um, but just let it be a total mess and just get to the end. And then you can go back. But, you know, I, my second, my, I, my first novel's in my basement. My second novel, I wrote for nine years and never finished. And it's because I kept rewriting the first 200 pages over and over and over and over and over. So you got to just allow, just promise yourself, okay, I'm going to come back and fix all this later, but not now. So. Turn, turn, just put the blinders on. And no, <laughs> and well, no, that's a really great, and now that mm -hmm. is perfect, actually, because that's what you need, you mm -hmm. know? Yep. That's very, very true. <laughs> it's hard, it's hard, though, because you don't, you don't want to look at it and be like, oh, well, that sentence is terrible, and that one doesn't even make sense, and, you know, you don't, but just, Give yourself permission to let it be for now and come back later. <laughs> exactly. Just out of curiosity, are you an extrovert or an introvert? And how does that affect your writing? I'm an introvert. Really? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I'm really trying to lay down a certain number of words every day and I go out for lunch or you know, whatever, if I'm, I'm not writing right now and I'm doing a lot of interviews right now, but if I were writing and I was trying to switch gears between doing interviews and writing, um, that wouldn't be a very good thing because the energy cost is so high to go do that. So, yeah. I have to, I have literally the reverse problem. <laughs> My, um, I'm an extra, I have like three friends that are extrovert writers <laughs> and it's like, you just have to say, no, don't talk to people. Don't do this. Put your phone down. Concentrate. <laughs> concentrate. Yep. Go talk to your characters and talk yeah. to your, your reader through the pages. Yes. It's, yeah. it's a whole, it, it's a struggle. It really, it really, I'm envious of, of, of writers who are introverts because I feel like it's a lot less stress. <laughs> well, it's a struggle either way because I think, you know, everybody's got strengths and, you know, everybody's got ways that they work best. And I think the secret is always figuring out what those are for you. And so maybe as an extrovert, you know, that's a, a really good, you know, like a, a critique group or a writing group, you know, where you can meet and talk and get your feedback. Maybe that's a very good way, you know, to go about it if you're an extrovert and then you also get that interaction. Too. That's interesting. We actually just started a word weavers group in our area and that's actually helped do a lot of motivation because my, I'm, I'm similar. I have problems with procrastination as well. And it's like, once I pick up something, I'm good. Like once I actually get I can, I can keep that habit going, but starting something, starting that habit is a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Getting, getting dialed in is rough. And I find it takes even just to dial in for the day, it's 20 to 40 minutes. But if you can just push through that 20 to 40 minutes, then usually you'll be okay. Exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've really That's enjoyed talking pleasure. with you. I feel like I've learned a lot too. I just, I, I love seeing what makes other writers tick, like what, mm -hmm. what helps them and, and just how, because everyone is different. Everyone has a completely different that style, but yeah. somehow we all make it work. <laughs> somehow we make it work. Real quick. Yeah. Uh, what's your, your website, social media, different ways where people can find you, learn more about what yep. you're writing. Uh, so my website is toscalee.com and my, I'm on social media is toscalee, uh, Facebook, it's author toscalee. So, but all my, all the links to my social media is on my website. So it's all there. My blog's there. You can learn awesome. about the book. Yeah. Be sure to check out the book too. Uh, the Line Between. The Line Between. Yep. Awesome. And it just came out a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? Yeah, about, well, uh, it's been two months now, eight weeks. Really? Oh, so, wow. But the sequel's coming up. A single light is coming up. So, so time you get done with all these interviews and all these tours and everything, you can take a It'll rest. It'll be time, time to like to amp do up it all to over that. again. <laughs> Seriously, this has been kind of close together. So that's okay though. That's fun. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you guys for watching Genre Chat, and we'll see you next time.